Today's reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Can you hear me? Okay. You guys couldn't have picked better hymns. They go right with the sermon. And did you hear those last words of the, um, and can it be? Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Do you realize the amazing love that you have in Jesus Christ? If you'll join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word, Lord. We thank you that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, that he provided us the light, Lord, that we can be light to others. Lord, may we absorb the, your words today. May we hear them. May they not fall on deaf ears, Lord, but they, may they soften our heart and change our, our heart, Lord, that we are a new creation in Jesus Christ, that we are not our own, that we are not condemned by our sins or anything else, Lord. Help us to love as Jesus loved in this world, Lord, and to long to see His coming. Lord, through the Spirit, guide us each and every day. Give us the gifts that you desire to give us, Lord, and help to produce in our lives the fruit that the Spirit produces, Lord. Again, we thank you for the time that we can come and fellowship and, and learn freely, Lord, not be persecuted. Be with those that aren't with us today, Lord, and bring them back safely into the fold. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So... I think most of you probably know. Do you know what a fetter is? I had to look it up this time. I sang that song and sang that song, and I was like, what's a fetter every time? So I looked it up. What's a fetter, Mark? It's tying your heart as, is, as, a, as in a prisoner to God. God. You, you're asking Him to, to chain you up as a prisoner, your heart to Him. Wow. So if you're following along, you know I'm going to talk about this guy named Matthew or Levi next. And I've entitled this, It's Time to Put Your Money. There you go. See, you all know it. Do you do it, though? <laughs> or do we talk so much and talk so much and not necessarily live like that? Is Christ your being? Is everything that you do stationed around being like Him in this world because of what He's done for you? This amazing love, how can it be that Thou, my Lord, would die for me? Luke 5, verse 27 to 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. He simply said, follow me. That's it. No other conversation. We, we don't know if he knew Matthew at this point or not or anything else. He just looked at Matthew with a longing love to him and said, follow me. Does, he mean, does Jesus mean everything to you? Would you leave the world behind? You say you would, but do you put your money where your mouth is? Matthew did. And Levi got up, he left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were seated with him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the, laws who belong, of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you read in Mark's account, and this account is in the Gospel of Mark and, the Go and uh, Matthew's Gospel, and 
following it is exactly, in each of the other ones, exactly what we're going to get into in Luke today. The, this parable Jesus tells about clothing and about wine and wineskins. They all follow right there, which is unusual in the Gospels, especially in Luke's account because he's writing this orderly account and he's placing these things precisely as, as he has learned and studied and as the Holy Spirit guides him to teach you what you know already so that you will know it with certainty and live it. Mark's account in Mark chapter 2, verse 13, once again Jesus went outside beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. So don't miss that. This is what Jesus did. He went out to the crowds. They came for healing. He went for teaching. Okay? Which one do you want? Do you want a Savior that does what you want Him to do? Or are you willing to do what the Savior calls you to do? Is He your Lord, your Master, your King? Will you follow Him even into the wilderness to wherever it takes? Will you follow Him when you don't have the security of your life and everything and pray to the Father for daily bread? Do you have the desire that he had to give up everything to come and save, to seek out and save the lost? As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphia, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, and his disciples for there were many who followed him. So we've got a little more information here. We know that Jesus was out teaching. We know the crowds were there again. But we also know that there were many who started following Jesus because they believed Jesus had the words of life. They knew that He did mighty works by the hand of God or by the finger of God. And they knew He was at least someone that came by, from God. But is He the Son of God? But we've already got where Luke has presented to us that Jesus said what's harder to say to a lame man to get up and walk or to say your sins are forgiven. I will prove to you I have authority and power to forgive sins by healing this man. Pick up your mat and walk. This is where we're at in the story. We had the story of the leopard. We've had the, the, de the demons that obeyed the Jesus and everything else. And now there are many who have chose to be a disciple of Jesus. And you know what it takes to be a disciple. That's why it's right here to remind you constantly. If anyone wants to be a disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. This is from Mark, right? Let me make sure. Yep, Mark. Luke's account says that we are to do this daily, that we're to take up our cross daily. We have to be reminded of that. This battle that we face, this spiritual battle, doesn't cease. It doesn't end. There's not a time out for you to, to do anything else. It's a constant war that you're facing with spiritual powers, with darkness, and you are light in Jesus Christ. Are you shining as the light that you should be? So there were many who followed Jesus. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now you don't know from Mark's point of view if the crowd had this attitude or not. But we have a contrast in the story. We have those that come to Jesus that want something from Jesus. Maybe they're not sure what it is yet. And Jesus is teaching them. He has the words of life. He knows he, he is the Word made flesh and dwelling among us. He is the Messiah. Will they believe this? Who is this Jesus? The whole world is thinking. But the religious aren't really thinking that. Their minds are on what he's done wrong, what's going to cost them, whatever it is, and they're in confrontation with Jesus. And they want to ask his disciples, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Where is their compassion? Where is their love for mankind? Oh, they're zealous for the law, but what about a soul of a human being? The life of the human being today and the poverty or misery they're in. Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus answers them, but He's also answering the crowds. He's also answering His disciples. Which one are you? Are you healthy and you don't need a physician? Or do you need a physician? Because we are all like that leper. We are all dead in our trespasses and sin. 
We all need someone to save us. It is impossible for man to save himself. But all things are possible through God. In Matthew's account, it's in chapter 9 of Matthew, we'll start in verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Wait a minute. Levi, Levi. Matthew calls himself Matthew. I wonder why. I don't have the answer. What does Levi and Matthew mean? We look at some word studies and see the difference there. But Matthew calls himself Matthew, and we'll get to that in a minute. Sitting at a tax collector's booth, follow him, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, he asked, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now that's different. We don't have this in the other accounts. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And this is from the book of Hosea. You need to go back and think about what the book of Hosea is and the adulterous lifestyle that the children of God had where they had so many other lovers and everything. And God said, I will continue to love you no matter what. I love you. What an amazing love that God has for the unfaithful, for the adulterers. And there's also a part in there where God gives mercy and grace because not only are we to not to deserve these things, but really we deserve God's wrath for what we do. We deserve God to divorce us, but that's not something that's in His nature. He loves us enough that He would send His Son to die for us. Jesus thought about it, and Matthew had wrote it earlier in, in his gospel account. and said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Are you merciful? Mercy, again, means that you see the state of the person in, that the pitiful state that they're in, doesn't matter why they're in it or anything, and you have compassion enough to act upon it. I can de de define it several different ways, but that's what mercy is. That you feel pitiful for that person, you feel compassion for that person, and you desire to do something to help that person. Now, that person has to help themselves and everything else, and that's why God gives us grace upon grace upon grace. He offers us something that we don't deserve. We deserve His wrath. But because of Jesus Christ, we're pardoned from our sins and adopted into God's family. Wow! Follow me! That is what Jesus calls us to do. He doesn't call us to clean up our act first, anything else. He just says, follow me. And you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven as a child of God. But He doesn't take us now. We have to live now. So we have to live according to the Spirit and live like Jesus did in this world, world and learn what Jesus said and what Jesus did and want to do it, not just, well, it's time to put our money where our mouth is, right? After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector, a publican. That's how Luke's gospel starts in verse 27. I don't know if yours has tax collector or publican, but let me explain what they were first. I explained to you what the leper meant and that that meant darkness and death and what sin had caused and excommunication from the family of God. He could only live with other lepers. The, the pain and suffering, oh, they didn't even have pain. They, but their hands could get gnawed off in the middle of the night, fingers, whatever it is, and this can, would continue to spread. It was like death. And here's this tax collector who gave up his life in Israel as an Israelite. He left his family and his friends for the love of money. We're right back to that again. Oh, wait a minute. The love of money is the root of all evil or all kinds of evil. That you would give up your birthright, that you would sell your birthright. Oh, that's not a new story, is it? That goes back to Esau and Jacob. Oh, that goes back to Cain and Abel, doesn't it, does it not? 
But we don't want to think that we love money because we want to think that we're better than that, that we're more righteous than that. But Levi gave up everything for money. The Roman government came in and occupied a country and they sold out rights to collect taxes to those who would betray their family and friends for money. But it's okay because that money would be quite a bit. So that all these things that I had to live with that I've done and everything else and the scorn from my family and friends and I'd never be a part of, of the culture or anything else again, it's okay because I got money. And there are others that do the same. That's why there were other tax collectors. So I've got them. I don't remember so many times when I was teaching the kids in the youth group and they're like, well, you know, if I do go to hell, I'll just party with my friends there. That's not what it's going to be like. But is that what Matthew thought? How in the world could Esau sell out his birthright for a bowl of stew because he was hungry? What things have we done that we didn't think we would do for the love of money? The comfort that we have, that's a love of money. The reason we don't like to pray for daily bread is because we like to be comfortable. We put our faith and trust in the finances we have, the health that we have, the family that we have. Levi just put all his into finances. But he was scorned for doing that. Not only by the Pharisees, but by the crowds and everything as well. Because this man betrayed them and sent them into poverty so that he could be rich. I did a little thing with the uh, TNT kids and I gave them quarters as they answered their Bible verses right. And then I taxed them afterwards. They didn't like that. Then I taxed them severely and they certainly didn't like that. I said, what do you think about me? We don't like you. They got it. Matthew was able to take money to line his own pockets, and he was rich. We'll get to that in a second. This is not the first time Luke has used that word publican. He used it before in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 3, verse 12. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Even tax collectors. All kind of sinners came to be, tax collect, I mean, to be baptized, but even tax collectors came. You get it? They were the lowest of the low, but some of them realized their sin and they repented for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. They said to, to John, they said, Teacher, what must we do? Collect no more taxes than you're authorized, he answered. Oh, an honest tax collector. If you study history and you read works outside of, of the, just the Bible, you'll find there were no honest tax collectors. If they were, this was an amazing, amazing thing, whether it was in Israel or anywhere else. Because the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. They had open ability to steal, and they were protected by the Roman government for doing so. So how many people would have integrity and stuff then? And then in ver chapter 7, verse 29, we'll read on in the future, all the people who heard this, even to tax collectors, acknowledged God's justice. For they had received the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, there's the but, and experts of the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Did you get that? They rejected God's purpose for themselves. What's your purpose? Has Jesus called you to follow Him? If he, if he has, have you put your money where your mouth is? Are you living the same style of life you were before? The same thing. Now, He doesn't call all of us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor and follow after Him. But He does call us to be like Christ in this world. To be a new creation. To, to be led by the Spirit and led into all truth to have peace and joy that surpasses all understanding, to not worry about the things of this world, but to rely on the Father in heaven to provide them for you, and to be merciful and gracious because you've been given mercy and grace. As you read on in Luke chapter 7, verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine, 
and you say he has a demon. Oh, that's important because this is that's Luke building on this story because they're going to say Jesus shouldn't be eating and drinking with these kind of people. Verse 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, look at this glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is vindicated by all her children. How are you living? Are you a child of God? Are you living like Christ, like a little Christ in this world? So much that when other people see you, they say, Christian, and that's a good thing, <laughs> not a derogatory term. In Luke 15, verse 1, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around to listen to Jesus. So the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble. We're, we're to Luke chapter 15 now. We're just in Luke chapter 5 now. And look how the Pharisees are hardening their heart when all Jesus wants to do is give them purpose and meaning. By taking away the things they used to live for, the gods that they've had, and give, replace them with the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, Jesus Christ. The only way, the only truth, the only life. And they began to grumble, Luke 15, verse 2. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Has fellowship with them. Has celebration with them. In Luke chapter 18, verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a... You've got the pattern here now a publican or a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, swindlers, ev evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Have you got a feeling for what they thought about tax collectors? I fast twice a week, pay tithes of all that I acquire. But the tax collector stood at a distance unwilling even to lift up his eyes to heaven. Instead, he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And then if we keep reading, you'll read in Luke chapter 19 about a wee little man named Zacchaeus the chief tax collector. What would he do? Well, we'll talk about that more later. For now, Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans 3, verse 21, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, as attested by the law and the prophets. And the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There you go. There is no distinction. Why? This ties it together. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard or the glory of God. And they all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I'm going to add this part in. It's not there. Even tax collectors. And you know Romans 6, verse 23. Starts, I'm going to start reading verse 21. What fruit... Did you reap at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? Is this how Matthew felt? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you reap leads to holiness and the outcome is eternal life. Why? Tie this all together again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that day, Matthew had to face his self. He wasn't expecting Jesus to walk by and speak to him that day. Like I said, I don't know what they had said before or anything. But that day, Jesus came by and he said, Today, not later, don't think about it, follow me. Which you've got to learn what that stands for again. Just like if it says here, that means hear and obey. Follow means leave the rest behind. Don't ever longingly look back at it because you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven if you do. Leave it all behind and come follow me. And oh yeah, that's going to take denying yourself. It's going to take doing it all the time. It's going to take friends and family to do that. And I'm going to give you the spirit to tie you together to have fellowship with one another. I'm going to give gifts to them and gifts to you so that you can be one body working, one church 
a new way of celebrating, a new way of living and witnessing to people, being a light to the world that the children of Israel have failed to do for century, century after century after century. And that's because they didn't love me with all their heart and they didn't get rid of their foreign gods. So here we are in the Gospel of Luke. Kim said last week she, or was it last week, whenever it was, that you seem to identify more with the person that was brought to Jesus. You've got all these different audiences. You've got the crowd. You've got the Pharisees. You've got the person in there. But here you are in Luke's Gospel and in Matthew's and in Mark's where you've got to say, how am I compared to Matthew? You've got to say this because you've seen all the presentation of who Jesus is and his encounters with all these other people. But now am I going to sit here at the state that I'm in when Jesus calls me or am I going to be changed for Him? Do I truly, truly believe and does my faith show it? Or am I just going to profess Him with my lips and my heart be far from Him? Certainly, and we see it going on and on, I'm not going to keep being like these Pharisees are, are we? Am I going to come out of the darkness into the light? Because I, or am I afraid because... I know that my deeds will be exposed. And those deeds as simple as trusting in your health, your family, your money, means you don't trust God enough. And I think Jesus might call that a sin. He tells us just to have mustard-sized seed faith, just to have that faith, and we, He will increase it. just to come as a little child to Him. Do you believe? Then put your money where your mouth is. After this, Jesus went up and saw a tax collector or a publican by the name of Levi. It means joined or united is what it means. But what was Levi joined to? The ways of the world. It's easy to get entangled in that. It's so easy. God gave us the things. It's a... It's, it's a topic that's in the church today is doctrine that God gave us these things to enjoy them that is true but he doesn't bless you more as a Christian or less as a Christian you live in a fallen world and you're called to be a light in this world you're called to do good deeds that will glorify your father in heaven if you're blessed bless others but don't sit here and think that I am blessed because I am a child of God blessed means that you're in a right standing with God you have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That you'll be fine in any circumstance that you're in. So that no matter if you're out on the sea seeing where your family perished or not, you can say, it is well with my soul. Is it well with your soul? That you know Jesus Christ and that you have been pardoned from your sin? You've got to know what sin is first and you've, you've got to repent of that sin and that means get up and leave it behind. Never look back at it. Matthew means gift of Jehovah. You know, I don't think it's coincidence Matthew called himself Matthew because he knew the gift that he had. The gift that he had been given, I don't think he ever looked back. I don't think he ever feared what would happen to him. I think he just looked forward to Jesus. And of course, Jesus turned him into a fisher of men. Who would have ever thought that a tax collector would be the first gospel of the New Testament? That scum. I guess if Jesus can use a tax collector, he can use even me and you. But where's the proof? It's easy to say you're a Christian. But a Christian is supposed to be like Christ. A Christian answers the call that Christ gives them. They don't wait. They don't say how. They just follow Jesus. And the rest comes into place. Matthew only mentions in his gospel, mentions his name one other time. And that's when he is in the count of the twelve. He lists his name again as Matthew a gift of God. He has answered Jesus' call. After this, Jesus went out and saw a text collector by the name of Levi in Luke 
sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said. So what happened next? Matthew put his money where his mouth was. A lot of money. We're talking about an oppressed society again who most of them didn't have money for their offerings that were required, so they had to, to go to the temple courts, which Jesus cleansed, cleansed again, to buy birds because that's all they could afford for their offering. And Matthew sitting in his house that was able to accommodate all of these people. He had a fine home. He had a lot of riches of this world. He was protected, like I said, a friend of Rome. You couldn't touch him. But he walked away when Jesus simply said, Follow me. Verse 28, Levi got up, he left everything and followed him. Did you notice? I've got to go find it again back here in Matthew's account. Matthew's account read this way. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, huh? Matthew doesn't even say anything that, about this that Luke says. Luke says that he left everything and followed him. Matthew doesn't even acknowledge that. You know why I think that is? Because Matthew doesn't consider it that he left anything. He considered it all garbage or rubbish to gain Christ. I think Paul said something very similar to that also. Did he not? Is that how you feel? That everything that you once thought was gain is now you consider it useless? Rubbish? Something that you would throw out in the landfill? for the fact that you've gained Jesus Christ. And that means that you live for Christ. Again, you never longingly look back at these things because you realize they were all rubbish. Matthew left his easy chair, his deep money bags, and he never looked back. And remember, he had sold his birthright before. He didn't sell it for a cup of stew. He sold it for a lot of money. But how would he be accepted now? He wouldn't be, that's obvious, because they grumbled and complained. But he didn't worry about that again. He didn't worry about how hard the road would be going forward following Jesus. He just said, I'm going to follow Jesus because I know that He has the words of eternal life. I know that He loves me. And I don't know any of the other dynamics except to get up and leave this behind and follow Jesus. And Jesus will take care of the rest. He was a traitor as much as a publican. Maybe if this guy cleaned up his act first, maybe we would accept him. But isn't the gospel for everyone? But yet how many times do we not want to talk to that person or go take the gospel to that person? Oh, I get it. I know the guy sitting at the roadside that you, that you go by and he's got six dogs with him and he's got his sign and you say, no, you're really not trying to feed your family. It's, it's easy to think that. I understand that. I'll tell you what's easy, even easier to think. The terrorist that's down the road that bombed the school or whatever. Oh yeah, it's easy not to want to offer them the gospel. But Jesus offered it to everyone regardless. No respecter of persons. So why would you be a respecter of persons? Now that doesn't mean don't protect yourself. Don't use common sense, anything else. But don't have your heart hardened thinking that you're better than someone else. Because we all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all can only come to Him by repenting and turning to Jesus Christ. And the proof is in the pudding, or putting your money where your mouth is. The problem is, from the standpoint of the Pharisee, which Jesus labels as a hypocrite. Pharisee, again, means set apart. They were set apart to do God's bidding, but Jesus said, no, you're a hypocrite. You're just acting, wearing a mask like an actor on a stage. The problem there is you get your heart hardened and you don't realize you are drowning. So when somebody throws you the life preserver, you don't grab it. <coughs> we're all drowning in sin and death. We all fall short. And Jesus says simply, take the life preserver and follow me. That's all you need to do. But will the love of money keep you from doing it? Will something else keep you from doing it? Matthew humbled himself 
never looked back, only looked forward. He didn't hesitate. He got up and followed Jesus. Paul wrote it this way in Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Have you experienced that? Verse 29, Then Levi held a great banquet. We know that it's his, at his house from the others. He didn't go down to the civic center or anything else. His house was big enough to house them all. He had enough money to feed them. And he invited the other tax collectors. Why? Not because he longed for their approval or anything else anymore. He left his tax booth. He left it all behind. He wanted them to know Jesus. He wanted them to leave all the world behind too and, and fear everything that they could fear, but he didn't fear because he had complete peace knowing Jesus Christ, knowing that his sins had been forgiven, and he wanted the rest of his scumbag friends to know Jesus too. Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eaten with him. Oh, there's a tax collector. There's, class, there's a prostitute. There's whatever. Isn't it easy to want to point our fingers like that? That's exactly what the Pharisees did. But isn't it much better to say, look at all these people that have come to Jesus. I don't care about who they are, who they were, or anything else. All I care about is them coming to our Savior and then letting him be Lord of our life. Matthew was so overwhelmed and overjoyed that he had to celebrate. Oh yeah, the first miracle recorded in John, the first miracle of Jesus, period, was turning water into wine. So many Christians say, I didn't even do wine. We got grape juice today, just so you know. But there's nothing wrong with wine. I remember one time I did it, and Mike lately had to look in the... the our book of discipline to make sure I could do it. I said, I can do it. <laughs> I said, Jesus did it. I can do it. And then, and just a different topic. <laughs> but it was for celebrating. The wine was celebration. It was part of their society. They didn't have uh, Coke in the refrigerator and other things. They didn't have refrigeration. They had the grape of the wine, the harvest, and you celebrated. And when Jesus made the wine, the, the master of the ceremony said, Man, you've brought the good stuff out, rather than let the people get drunk first in bringing out the good stuff. Okay, that's the implication there. You brought out the good stuff. Because it's a time to celebrate now. We're, we're going to read that as we go on. <clears throat> but here's the problem. Verse 30. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect, they complained to his disciples, why do, you eat and dr why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They complained to others in the church. They see Susie over here witnessing and, and being like Jesus. They even call her a Jesus freak. And they complain to everyone else, why is she out there ministering to those people? What do you say when she does that? I hope you're like the disciples and stand up and say, because those people, I had to do it for the youth again. We, I got, almost got in fist fights with other pastors sometimes. But I couldn't stop because I didn't care about what they did. I cared about them coming to know Jesus Christ. So they complained to, their, to the disciples and Jesus answered them. It's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. So what does that mean? What is Jesus saying? What is he saying to you here? Everyone's sick. Everyone is that leper. Everyone is that tax collector. We fight that spiritual battle. There are demons roaming around, whether you're possessed by one or oppressed by one. This is the world we live in. You're not healthy. But the physician is here, the great physician.
but do you realize it? You're drowning, do you realize you need the life preserver? And Matthew makes it clear if you read his gospel. But go and learn what this means. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, these religious hypocrites, and he says, learn what this means from the book of Hosea, the story that's there, and I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You tithe to the least, to the exact tenth of your spices and everything, but you don't have mercy for the loss. Wake up. It's time to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to call those he had invited to the banquet, but they refused to come. The king was enraged. He sent his troops to destroy those murderers and burn their cities. Then he said to the servants, the wedding, is, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the crowds and invite to the banquet as many as you can find. I'm going to add this to Scripture again. Even tax collectors. If you have ears, listen. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. But there is none righteous, no, not one. But I, yet I think I am, so I am not going to let myself be called to repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and keep producing works that show proof of your repentance. Have you answered the call of repentance? Fully answered it. Or is there anything you're still going back to that tax booth from time to time? pulling out because you think you need it. Are you wearing a mask? Are you going through the motions? Or do you have a new way of thinking about things because you've repented that's changed your heart and you're letting the Holy Spirit write upon your heart the words of God so you'll be like Jesus? Merciful because He was merciful. Gracious because He's gracious. Loving because He's loving known by the love that we have. Are you Matthew in this story? Are you one of the Pharisees? Are you part of the crowd that's still undecided? Which one are you? A little while later, and Matthew and Mark record this exactly the same. Verse 33, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so, the disciples of the, so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. You might not have thought that was part of this story, but this is exactly part of this story, and like I said, it is exactly part of the story in the other Gospels. But it seems like it's a, a disjointed section. John's disciples fast and pray, and so do the Pharisees. This seems to be the way... But your disciples go on eating and drinking, celebrating. Why? Isn't this the right way? Isn't this the best wine? But see, the problem, well, it's not a problem. <laughs> the reality here, the, the, the celebration is, is the Savior had come, the Messiah had come. And He, changed, he is changing the way we're thinking especially since we've hardened our hearts so much that we've got into religious hypocrisy. It's okay to live. It's okay to love. It's okay to even associate yourself with sinners to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. I didn't say to go and sin with them or anything like that. Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners, and they called him a glutton and a sinner. He did not wasn't a glutton. He did not sin. He didn't drink wine to the point of excess and get drunk. He didn't sin with the sinners. He told them to go and sin no more. He brought them the good news of salvation. The church has been born. And Jesus will leave this earth and He will return. And He will leave His good and faithful stewards and servants behind to continue to pour the wine of the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus answered them again, just like He answered their hypocrisy before. Verse 34, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast 
while he is with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from him, and in those days they will fast. They are rejoicing now because the Messiah is here, spreading the news of the kingdom. Will you repent of the way you think so that your heart can be changed? Will you become merciful and compassionate because you care more about people's souls and the sin that they're in and not want to touch them because it will defile you? So verse 36, he told them this parable, a further teaching illustration to what just happened following up from the story of Matthew being called. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch the old one. Otherwise, they will, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. Now, I don't understand that fully, so if, if I can't explain it to you, Evelyn probably can, Barb probably can because they sew. But you don't put new fabric on old fabric because it's been stretched and everything. If you do that, it's going to tear and everybody should know that. But if you don't get this example I'm giving you, then how about this one? Verse 37. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the, the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. The new wine you can't put in old wine skins because it's been stretched as far as it can possibly be stretched. We've got bottles. We just go out and buy a bigger bottle. They had an animal skin that they put the wine in, and when you crush the grape, it starts to ferment. So if you drink grape juice, you're drinking low-grade wine, just so you know. It starts to ferment, and as it ferments, it expands, and that leather or animal hide or whatever expands with it and expands to its capacity. So you never want to put new wine in again because now it's become hard and stretched as far as it'll go because simply you put new wine in, it'll try to expand and ferment more and it will break. And you will lose the wine skin, but you'll lose the wine too. There's no rejoicing in that, okay? Verse 38, Now new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine, old wine wants the new. For they say the old is better. Be careful how you read this here. Okay, you knew you don't put old, new fabric on old garment. You don't put new wine skin in, into an old, new wine into an old wine skin. But you've got here, we know those things. Now we've got new wine. Well, nobody wants new wine. It's not aged, it's not as good. But we've got new wine that must be poured into new wine skins. It, it must be. And no one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for they say, don't miss this. You miss those three words, you miss the meaning of it. For they say the old is better. He's talking to the Pharisees. You say the old is better. You say fasting and prayer is better because you're relying on your own self-righteousness. The Messiah has come. The new way is here. It's time to repent. Change your way of thinking so your heart can be changed because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Will you accept Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life? Will you leave the ways of your old life behind? Will you leave that tax collector's booth and never look back? Or will you stand in your hypocrisy and judge others, thinking that if you can go in and read your Bible and practice everything and that yet say in your heart, Ugh, that tax collector over there, you've missed the whole point of the gospel. Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Are you in the shoes of the Pharisee at this point? Or are you in the shoes of Matthew? Because at this point now, he has left his tax booth behind. He can never go back to it. You don't know where he's at in his story now. If, if he's being rejected by the crowds that the Roman government's coming after him, you don't know that. But you know that he denied himself, took up his cross, and followed after Jesus. Are you still sitting here saying the old way is better? Or are you saying, hey, maybe Jesus needs to soften my heart? We're going to take communion today, and I want you to think about that. We have grape juice, not wine. I want you to think about what Jesus did for you. He gave example again of, his, of the wine being his blood. Life blood poured out for you. Because... He gave His life up to save yours. The bread represents the body of Christ given for you. He held nothing back. God poured out His wrath, Isaiah says, to the point where Jesus was unrecognizable as a human being. He was silent 
No way could I have been silent before my accusers. They spit at him, they mocked him, they beat him to pieces. They ridiculed him. And yet the truth was put in a placard over his head. This is the king of the Jews. The king of kings. They wanted it to say, no, he said it. he was. No, Jesus is. He didn't just say, he proved it by getting to, up to, to the paralytic and saying, take up your mat and walk. He proved that he had the authority and the power to forgive sins. Has he forgiven your sins? Then make sure you leave the tax collector's booth behind. Never look back. Come and take this Lord's Supper in the way that it was meant to as a remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for you so that you will go out into the world as a light, as an example, and tell others and not be a respecter of persons, but to offer the gospel message to each and every one of the lost because that's exactly what Jesus did. So I'm going to pray over the elements and you can come as you choose um, and partake. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. You have made your mysteries known to children, Lord, and all we need is childlike faith to come to you. We thank you, Lord, for, for, for calling us. And Lord, help us increase our faith. Help us to have the strength and the faith to walk away, knowing that it's not by our own might that we'll do it, but by fixing our eyes on Jesus and by being attuned to the Spirit so we walk in step with the Spirit. Thank you that Jesus said that I am going to prepare a place for you, but where I'm going, I'm going there so that you can be with me also, and I'll never forsake you or orphan you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit coming where we can cry out to you as Father in heaven. We thank you that we know without a doubt that Jesus has paid all of the price that he said it was finished, that nothing can ever separate us from your love because of Christ Jesus' love for us. Father, we look at the example that Luke writes and we look at Matthew's humble example of how he never looked back, but he just looked forward. Help us to do that together and run this race with perseverance, Father. And help us to, along the way, present that gospel to even tax collectors and sinners. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.